So again, we're seeing these measures, whether they're genetic or environmental, maybe at the group level can tell us something, but certainly don't dictate what happens at the individual level because our genes and our environment interact to lead to unique outcomes. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now in this series of videos we're taking a look at the nature-nurture question and in the last video we saw that genes don't work the way most people think they do. It turns out each gene can code for many different proteins depending on the environment and similarly different genes can code for the same exact protein depending on the environment and we saw what impact this has upon learning except we were looking at rats. So today Let's take a look at humans. The paper I've selected today is called Predicting Educational Achievement from Genomic Measures and Socioeconomic Status by Stum and colleagues. Now to understand this paper, we have to briefly take a look at what's called genome-wide sequencing. So even with the only 19,000 protein coding genes human beings have, there is still this belief that we've got a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between gene and outcome. For instance, there is one gene for eye color, or there is one gene for height. And unfortunately, despite all of our best research, we were never able to find any of these one-to-one -one genes. It turns out, outside of some very rare medical conditions, every human characteristic is defined by many different genes, each contributing a small proportion. So for instance, eye color. There is no single gene for brown or blue or green eyes. It turns out at last count, it's likely an amalgamation of over 900 genes and for height, we've got over 1,100 genes. In fact, so crazy has this become, there is now a theory in mainstream genetics called omnigenic influence, which argues that literally every gene in your body influences every single trait you have. Some will do it in a more direct manner than others, but at some level, every gene we have influences our height. Every gene we have influences our eye color. Now that's a topic we can dive deeply into in its own right, and I don't really wanna focus there. What researchers started to do is they started to map entire genome sequences in people to give them what's called a polygenic score. Now that sounds scary, but it's totally simple. All you've got to do is this, pick a trait. So let's say obesity. What you do is you get a bunch of people who demonstrate that trait. So let's say a thousand obese people, you map their entire genome sequence and you don't look for the one gene that they all share. You look at the dozens of genes they all seem to share. And whether that's 100 genes or 1,000 genes, we then say that group of genes must influence obesity. Now we take a new person, someone who's neutral, we take a look at their genome and we see how many of this group of genes do you have. And from that, we can derive a susceptibility score. So let's say you only have two of the 1,000 overlapping obesity genes, you'd have a low obesity score. But if you have 900, we'd say you have a high obesity score. Now the point to recognize is this, is your score individually won't tell you much. You could have all thousand genes for obesity and still be totally thin, or only one obesity gene and be obese. This polygenic score, unfortunately, isn't really good for predicting at the individual level. It just gives you kind of a susceptibility measure, but based on your thoughts, your actions, that will drive your outcome. The genes don't dictate, it just says you're more or less likely. All right, so let's bring in this paper now. What these researchers did was using data from thousands of people genetically tested in the past. They took the highest achieving academic students, compared their DNA, and came up with their set of dozens of genes that correlate with strong academic performance. Next, they took 5,000 different kids, genetically sequenced them, and gave them each a polygenic score. So essentially, how much do your genes match the genes from the highest achieving students in the past? And they also measured each kid's socioeconomic status. And what they did is they then compared these to actual academic performance. Were your genes or was your SES strong enough to predict academic achievement at age 16? And here's what they found. So let's just start with that genetic score. So kids in the top 10% of polygenic scores, so those 10% of kids who match most closely to the successful students of the past, were on average in the 90th percentile of GCSE at age 16. Meanwhile, those kids in the lowest 10%, so the 500 kids who least matched the genetic pattern of successful students from the past, scored on average only in the 25th percentile of the GCSE. So it looks like we've got ourselves a pretty strong measure here. If I know your genes, I can tell whether or not you're gonna be in the top 10% or the bottom 25%. But remember, polygenic score isn't good at the individual level. It's only good at the group level. Any individual based on their unique thoughts and actions can go any which way. 
So watch what happens when we look at the individual data from these groups. So if we look at just the top 10%, those people with the best genes for academic success, we get a wide range of performances, as low as some students scoring in only the third percentile. Meanwhile, if we look at those kids with the worst genetic markers for academic achievement, again, we see a very wide range with some kids scoring in the 97th percentile. In fact, 105 students with the lowest genetic score outperformed 139 students with the highest genetic score. That's over 20% of the kids we most expected to fail outperforming those kids we most expected to succeed. So here's where we see genes are highly interactive with the environment and at an individual level, they don't really tell us all that much. Now, some people, including the authors of this paper said, maybe we should use genetics now to weed through students early on to determine how we should start to stream them. But hopefully you see by looking at that individual data, that's a real scary proposition. I don't know about you, but I don't wanna be in charge of telling those 105 students who we know are going to succeed, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to go further in school because you don't have the right genes. It just gets pretty scary. But watch this. After learning about that genetic data, most people say, well, cool, it must be environment. So let's take a look at the SES data. So those kids in the top 10% rated SES scored on average in the 90th percentile GCSE, while the kids in the bottom 10% of SES scored on average in the 25th percentile GCSE. So the same as the genetic data, but do we suffer from the same individuality problem? Well, let's take a look. Of those kids with the top 10% SES, again, we have a very wide range with some kids scoring as low as the third percentile. And those kids in the bottom 10% SES, we again have a huge range with some kids scoring as high as the 97th percentile. In fact, with regards to SES, 75 students in the bottom 10% outscored 109 students from the top 10%. So again, we're seeing these measures, whether they're genetic or environmental, maybe at the group level can tell us something, but certainly don't dictate what happens at the individual level because our genes and our environment interact to lead to unique outcomes. And when it comes to questions of schooling, then we're left with this question, well, what do I do? Do I tackle the genes or do I tackle the environment? And hopefully see the answer to this is pretty simple. We can't tackle the genes. Whatever your genes are, that's what they're gonna be. That is off the table but that doesn't really matter because we can play with environment. We can start to tweak the world you live in, which makes the specific genes you have largely obsolete because these environmental changes can change the expression of each of these genes. So as teachers, it's wrong to say that environment is all that matters. It all matters, but the only thing we can focus on is environment. And we start to see that in the best possible environments, even the weakest of genes starts to flip their expression and lead to powerful, unexpected outcomes. Now we've got an issue that we still haven't dealt with yet, and it's this question of heritability. Well, if genes and environment are intertwined, where then do we get these heritability measurements? Like by saying intelligence is 80% heritable or height is 90% heritable. Well, that's what we'll take a look at in the next video. We're gonna start to deconstruct heritability. Where does that measurement come from? And is it really a meaningful number to think about? So thanks so much for watching. I hope you got something good and I'll see you guys at the next video. Bye y'all.